give me the patience, oh Lord, this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, patience to wait to get response from you. Patience to wait to get answers to my prayers. I will not hurry out of the presence of the Lord. I will not hurry out of the out of fellowship with the Lord. I will wait to get answers to my prayer. I will wait to get response. Begin to pray. I ask God, oh Lord, this morning. Father, release patience to your people this morning. Release patience to your people this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Grace unto us this morning. Amen. The grace to hear from you. The grace to sit down in your presence and listen oh, to what you have to say. And listen to, to and listen to the instruction the for divine that you are about to give to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we worship you. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, we bless your name. We are still in the mood of prayer in that line. Say, God, help me to dwell and meditate in your words. Amen. Do not speak to the people through his words. This morning we need to pray, Lord, help me, give me the right spirit, give me the right mindset to dwell in your words and to get instructions from your words. Father, this morning, speak to us through your word. Speak to us, speak to us through your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, use your servants to speak to us. Use your servant to speak to us, oh Lord. Every word that will come out from this altar, let it minister to me. Let it minister to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we need to make that request this morning. Every word, every ministration that will come forth from this altar, let it speak to the situation. Let it speak to the situation. Let it be an instruction from, from God to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for myself this morning. I pray for your congregation this morning, oh Lord. Speak to your people through your words. Speak to your people through your word. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Say, Lord, give, give me the grace to dissect your word and get response from it. Amen. Give me the grace to dissect your word and get response from, from it. That means that God will give you the ability to understand that which has been spoken from the altar so that it can work for you. Amen. Begin to pray this morning. Father, as your word will come forth, oh Lord, as your ministry will come forth, give me the grace to dissect it so that I can get answers to my prayer for me. In the mighty name of Jesus, give me the grace, oh Lord. Give me the grace, oh Lord, to dissect your word. In the mighty name of Jesus. Give me the grace to dissect your word this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I have come here with a heart of expectation. Ah, we have come here this morning with a heart full of expectation, oh Lord. Let answer be released through your word, oh Lord. And give me the abilities that when that answer is released, give me the grace to dissect it so that it can respond to my situation. Amen. So that it can respond to my situation. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Brethren, let's begin to pray for the church of Christ in general now. Let's pray for every gathering of the saints today. Let's use house of praise as a point of contact to every pray, every area that people will be gathering today to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit to take over the services. In the mighty name of Jesus, Holy Spirit will invite you. Holy Spirit will invite you into our midst this morning. Take preeminence control. Take preeminence control. Holy Spirit, come and dwell with us. Come and dine and wine with us. We want to koinomia with you, Lord, today. In the mighty name of Jesus. We want to dine and wine with you today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite you. We use house of prayer as a point of contact to every gathering of the saints today in Dundee, in Scotland, in the United Kingdom, in every area of the world in general. We pray, oh Lord, that our saints will be gathering today to render praises unto you. Let the heavens be open. So receive the praises, oh Lord. Let the heavens be open. So receive the praises this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite you to our presence. Father, come and fellowship with us. Amen. Father, come and fellowship with us. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's begin to pray for everyone who is on their way to church today. Those who are still contemplating, should I come to church or not? Let's begin to commit them into the hands of God. Let the Lord direct them to fellowship to, to His presence this morning. Oh, Father, we pray for people who are coming on to church. People who are still on their way. And even those that are already here. Even those that are still contemplating on coming. Should I come to church or not? Holy Spirit, go and minister to them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, direct their footsteps unto your presence this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, direct their footsteps into direct their footsteps this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we worship you. Thank you, Lord. 
Let's intercede on behalf of everyone who has come into the presence of the Lord today, and even those watching online who have come with a heart of expectation. Father, let our expectations not be cut short. Amen. Continue to pray now in the mighty Amen. name of Jesus. Father, we intercede on behalf of every member of House of Praise who have come today to your presence, expecting to hear from you, expecting answers to their prayers. Jehovah, let our expectations not be cut short. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, release answers to our secret prayers. Release answers to our prayers this morning. Let answers be released from your throne of grace. Let answers be released from your throne of grace. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we worship you. We know that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly. Above all that we have ever asked or wished, according to your power that worketh in us. Amen. May your name alone be highly exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's commit the world for us into the hands of God. Let's commit the pastorate, the choir, the Sunday school team, in every workforce, the transport unit. Let's commit them into the hands of God that today they will all walk in accordance to the will of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray, oh Lord. Let's continue to pray. Pray for the pastor, oh Lord. Jehovah, we pray for the pastor. We pray for the pastor, oh Lord, as he go, as he mounts the few bits to preach your words to your people today. Ah, Father, help him, oh Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Help him, oh Lord. Speak through him, oh Lord. Minister to our situation through him. Give him instruction for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for the choir. As they will be ministering, oh Lord, Jehovah, they will minister to God, to, to, they will minister to, to, to your people, and your people will be drawn closer to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for the orchards, we pray for the children church, we pray for every department in this church. Jehovah, let them begin to walk in accordance with your will. In the mighty name of Jesus, the purpose that by which you have brought us together today, that purpose will be achieved. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus, we come against every distraction. We come against every 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 alternative power that work against the workforce of the, of the Lord. Jehovah, they will not stand against us. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we worship you. We bless your name. Let's begin to commit the reminder of the services to the hand of God. Father, take preeminent control. Take control of today's service in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. From the beginning to the end, O oh Lord, take preeminent control. Take control. Take control, O oh Lord. We surrender the service into your evil hands. And we say, Holy Spirit, take control. Take charge, O oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we bless your name. Be thou exalted. Be magnified. Be glorified. We know that you are able to do exceedingly and above our expectations today. Father, we bless your name. We have come with an expectant heart, and we know that our answer will be released unto you today. Our ears are open to receive your divine instruction. Our heart is prepared to dissect your words today. Speak to us today. We bless your name. Thank you, our Father. For Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. You are the God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent anymore.
Yeah. Okay, at least you got two of them. Do justly and love mercy. Who can see the, the third one? And that one is actually in the front. Walk humbly with God. Thank you very much. So you've got 100 over 100. So let's put our hands together for him. Now, those are nuggets, something you know we consider very precious. And they form the fulcrum of what we're going to be looking at today. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Now, you know, those stones are put together, those gold stones are put together. And you know, for many of us that did mathematics, there's something we call sex theory. Do we remember? Those of us who did mathematics. Okay, with sex theory, there is an intersect of you know the numbers of pieces that put together, and that intersect is the common ground for all the three. Okay? So the common ground for these three nuggets is what we're looking at today. And it's restitution. Restitution. Do justly, love mercy, walk only with God. Okay? So today we're going to look at that. Our introduction, we look at the first thing. Let's look at the agenda. We can flip to the next week. The agenda, we look at the introduction and we look at um, the kinds of restitution and we look at also what we consider a satisfactory compensation. You know, this outline is already giving us an idea of what we're looking at today and then we'll, we will conclude and make summary of today's lesson. Now, our Bible passage is taken from Genesis chapter 33, and we'll read from verse 1 to 11. Genesis chapter 33, from verse 1 to 11. Remember, we are looking at restitution. Restitution. What it means. The kind of restitution. And what is considered as a satisfactory compensation. Restitution. But we'll read Genesis chapter 33, from verse 1 to 11. Um, are you able to get the Bible passage? Okay, while we're trying to get the Bible passage, let's do the memory scripture together first. So the memory scripture is from Mark, sorry, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? For to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk only with your God. You see, that's where the stones are coming from. The three stones, the three precious stones that we just saw. The things that the Lord requires from us is number one, to do what? Do justly. Second is to do what? Love mercy. And the third one is to walk only with your God. So this three mix is the full crumb of today's lesson. Do justly, love mercy, and walk with your God. So let's go back to the Bible passage. Genesis chapter 33 from verse 1. So, okay. Yeah, that now means that you need to open your Bible. For those of us that always rely on the, on the projector, the scripture is not coming on the projector this morning. So open your hard copy or your soft copy that you have in your hands. And I'll read from here. Now, Genesis chapter 33, uh, from verse 1 to 11, is a very interesting story between two brothers. You know, something that happened before this particular point in time, and then there is an opportunity to make right what was wrong. Now, now the Bible says in verse 1, it says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and within were 400 men. Jacob and Esau were brothers. So he divided the children. Now, this is Jacob. He divided the children among the Leah, one wife, Rachel, the second wife, and two maid servants. And he put the maid servants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Verse 4. But Esau, this is the brother now, but Esau ran to him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children. 
and said, Who are these with you? Verse 5. Verse, um, yes, 5. And he lifted his eye and said, Okay, that's verse 6 now. And the maid servant came near, and they and their children, and they bowed down. Verse 7. And Leah came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough. My brother, keep what you have for yourself. And then Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from me. Inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I have seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. And verse 11, the last one. Please take my blessings that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough, so he urged him, and he, looked, and he took it from him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for just in case there's anybody in the who, does, who does not have the background to this story, I'll quickly give you a recap. You know, Jacob and Esau were two brothers born to the same parents. And then, you know, there was a time when the father was old and he needed to pass on the blessing to the older of the two. One, the younger one, Jacob now, in conjunction with the mother, you know, deceived the father and Jacob took the blessing. And because he had done that, there was a breach and then there was a conflict in relationship. And Jacob had to run away from the house with the help of the mother. So he was sent away to the uncle, Laban. And I'm sure we read about that, how Jacob, you know, sojourned with Laban was a couple of weeks ago. But so Jacob dwelt with Lord Laban, and God blessed Laban and blessed Jacob. Now Jacob now is about to return him home. And there was something that he has taken that wasn't his. And this is an opportunity for him to make right what is wrong. Hence, the, today's lesson, restitution, is an opportunity for him to right what he had done wrong in the past. Then we will see how he was able to do that as we go on in the lesson. And the lesson for us in it. So that's the Bible passage. Now, as a matter of introduction, we will attempt to define what that word is, restitution. Maybe it's not a regular word that we use every day, but it's a very important one. Even in the legal system of the world, the word restitution is a very important one. Now, what is restitution? Restitution is the act of making right the wrong done against someone or an institution. Now, let's look at that very clearly. Re making right the wrong that was done against an individual or an institution. So, most of the time it's against an individual, but some of the time it could be against an institution. For example, our workplace, our employer, the company that employs us. For example, the government of where we live, the local government, the city council, the, you know, the national government of that, you can, you know, there can be a reason for us to make right what we have done wrong against that institution, even against the church, against any organization that it may be. So that's what restitution is, the act of making right what is wrong. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, God is just God, he's a just God, and he expects every one of us to act justly. Every one of us. And that's why in Micah chapter 6, verse 8 that we read, the scripture we read, he has shown us what is required of us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, in, in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3, says, Thus saith the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness, and deliver the plunder out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong, and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. This is what God is asking. Execute judgment. Execute righteousness. Whatever is right, whatever is just, that should be what is expected of us. So if you wrongfully you know, acquire something, that is injustice. And God expects us to act justly. Okay? So <clears throat> if that had happened, 
happen when we were not Christian? There is a call for us to remedy. Praise the Lord. There is a call for us to remedy that action. And I said it's very important to this mission, and that's why it's being taught today. Now, it is as much as it is a spiritual principle, it's also a world global legal system principle. The, the world system, the human relationship also tries on that concept of restitution. If you wrongfully acquire a property and you are taken to court, the courts will insist that you restore what you're taking. You may be forgiven, but then there is still that expectation that you should restore. Okay? So that's established. Now, in today's lesson outline, we'll look at two lesson outlines. And the first one talk about the kinds of restitution. So um, I took note, you know, the previous lessons that we have had on restitution um, in this mission, we have not made attempt to classify or to, you know, to you know, differentiate different kinds of restitution. But it's very important because knowledge is increasing and there is a requirement for us to know deeper into the things that is very important for us. So today we're going to be looking at kinds of restitution. So there are kinds of restitution. We'll look at them today. And the second lesson that we'll look at is what constitutes a satisfactory compensation. Now, if you are required by the concept of restitution to make right what was done wrong, then it means that there is going to be at the point in time when you know, the person who has done wrong will need to compensate for the wrong action. So there is also the need for us to know what is consist what constitutes satisfactory compensation. It's not just what you wish. For example, if somebody has wrongfully taken, let's just say, 10,000 pounds that belong to somebody else, and he is now, you know, coming through repentance, and he needs to get it right with God. You don't just give 10, uh, 1,000 in return for the 10,000. No, that compensation has to be satisfactory to both parties, as we're going to see in the lesson today. Okay, so the first lesson outlined, we're looking at the kind of restitution. As you can see on the projector, the first one is restitution of material loss, and the second one is restitution of personal loss. We're going to see the difference between the two now. The restitution of material loss is the act of giving back to a person something that was lost or stolen from that person. Now, you can underline that something, so it's an article, it's a material thing. It's something that is physical, something that you can quantify, something that can be measured. So the act of responding something that was, that was lost or stolen or of paying them money for the loss. So if that thing has been consumed, for example, and you cannot bring it out again, then you are required to pay the value in terms of money for that thing. Praise the Lord. So this is to do with compensating or repatriating or reimbursement of paying money or its equivalent to the victim. And I'll give us an example. I'll give us an example. You know, growing up, some people, you know, the teenage age especially, there's the, the urge to do a lot of experimenting. You understand what I'm talking about? Um, I, I, I've seen teenagers even today, not really because they are in need, but just because they call it a name. I can't even remember the name now. Because they just want to prove a thing. They, they, they can go shoplifting, for example. They can go into a store, just not necessarily because they are in need, but because they just want to prove that they can be invincible. I don't know. Yeah. Or because they prove that they can do stuff. You know, and they just go into the store and shoplift. Yes, the days of ignorance. They probably don't know better. But when that teenager grows up and becomes an adult and have come to the knowledge of Christ, and some of these things has to be restricted. Okay? So when you do that, when you take what does not rightfully belong to you, then you need to compensate back. So that's a good example. And I said one example here is Items of money forcefully taken from people. Items of money taken by false pretense. You know, some people might not forcefully take things from people, but they might have taken things from people out of pretense or deception. If you understate, for example, you know, if you're filing, I'm going to use this example, and maybe it can help us to illustrate. If you're filing for personal income tax, 
and you are doing independent filing, and you declare less than your earnings. Hello? You declare less than the value that you have earned over that period. You know the implication of that? It means you are paying less tax. And that is deceitfully taking what does not belong to you. That's a good example of deceitfully taking what does not belong to you. Because the law of the land says if you earn at this level, you must pay your tax at this level. So, because it is now within your, you know, your influence to determine your earnings, and you fail to determine the appropriate end, you have taken what does not rightfully belong to you. Now, it also involves deliberate or even accidental damages. Now, um, this may happen, you know, you work in the office and <laughs> you broke an equipment, and because nobody was looking, you know, it was an accident, you were not intentional. I'm, I'm trying to be very practical here. So, though it was an accident, it was not intentional, but because nobody was looking, you just patched it up and walked away. Praise the Lord. And you will see why it's very important for us to be very detailed. Our relationship with God is not something we take for granted. Every outer of it is important. And that's why God is giving us an avenue to make right what was wrong. And that's why we're talking about this today. So, you know, you broke the computer and it's not yours. I mean, nobody was looking and you just patched it up and you walked away. And the company comes and says, oh, this is very expensive. We have got to spend money to repair this now. And then you didn't hold up that you are the one because you are afraid of the consequence of holding up that you might be surcharged. You might be asked to pay for it. That is taking things, you know, a, a, a restriction that arises out of you know, deliberate or even accidental damages. Praise the Lord. So that is restitution of material loss. Things that can be quantified, things that can, you know, you can place value on it, things that, you know, you know, you know it's easier to restitute. Now the second category of restitution is restitution of personal loss. Personal loss, what do we mean? I said sometimes, the loss to a person may not be non-material. You know, when there is an action, the loss to an individual may not be a material thing. And it can be very difficult to value this kind of loss in, in, in the monetary context or in, in value, whatever value for it, for the purpose of compensation. These are referred to as personal loss. And I'll give us an example. Oftentimes this happens in relationship, you know, between people. An example is, when a person in a relationship deliberately or inadvertently cause someone to hurt. For example, when you speak haughty words against an individual, and that individual is emotionally disturbed because of your comments, that person is suffering a loss. And that loss is a personal loss. That loss cannot be quantified in monetary terms. That loss can that that loss cannot be, you know, analyzed in the way you would look at material loss. But however, that person is suffering a loss because his stress is distressed and he's having an emotional problem because of your action. That's something that we need to also consider. It says the pain could be an emotional or other non-material. Another example is when you bear false witness against an individual and that person not suffer a loss because of your witnessing against them or the things that they have not done. And that person could, for example, be put into jail because you have come to say, I'm an eyewitness to this event and this person was wrong on this ground. And you know, the court will only admit evidence that is visible. And then the court says so, on the basis of this evidence that there was an eyewitness to this event, this person is guilty and is put into jail. That victim is suffering a loss. And that loss cannot be quantifiable in monetary terms. Okay, we're going somewhere. So that's what we refer to as personal loss. An act of violating of other people, sexual assault, is also um, a loss that cannot be that cannot be quantified. For example, if an individual was raped, if the raper becomes a child of God and he wants to restitute, it becomes a little bit you know, difficult to evaluate how to compensate back that person. So that's the reason why we're looking at this. Like I said, in previous lessons, we look at restitution as a block. And you know, a lot of questions have also come up and says, 
in certain areas, restitution may be difficult to, 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 to evaluate. But even then, God requires that we restitute. Okay, let's go on. Now, so we've seen the two kinds of restitution. Restitution of material loss and restitution of personal loss. Let's move on to the next slide. The next slide says, now that's the slide we're looking at. Yeah, so I'm going to ask us to quickly participate in this now. We have four scriptures, so we're going to take them in two verses. Number one, 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 to 3, and Luke chapter 19, verse 8. I want to encourage you to open into those scriptures. And let's see what lessons we can learn from them. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 to, chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. If anybody is there, you can read for us, please. And someone said unto all Israel, Behold, I have taken unto your voice in all that you said unto me, and I have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and great headed. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Three. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord, and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass? Have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes? Therewith, and I will restore it unto you. Four. And they no, said, please, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, now we've seen that scripture, and I'm sure many of us have opened to that place. I just want two comments, two people, to tell us what can we learn from that scripture about restitution. Just two opinions, so that we can move on to the next one. What can we learn about restitution in that place? That was Samuel, the prophet, standing, and he was you know, telling the people, if I own anybody, let me know. I'm willing and ready to, to restitute. What can we learn? Sincerity. Thank you very much, sir. Sincerity. So, do you want to relate it to that scripture? How do you mean sincerity? Yes, he was being honest and uh, asking for anyone who he might have offended or defrauded to come out. From Thank his you. own point of view, he, he has done no wrong, but he was open to... He was open. From his own point of view, he has done no wrong. However, he was open to if there is anything that has happened. Maybe he escaped, he slipped through the crack, he couldn't pick it down. Thank you. So sincerity. Um, yes, another sister, point yes. there is um, humility. Humility. Yeah, Samuel was uh, the person that held office. He could have, as well as, not called for that, and nobody would be able to hold him accountable exactly. because he held office. But irrespective of your office, it's good to be humble and look out for those you need that you fought and restored to them. Whatever. Thank you very much. With those two points, it's very clear. And that for a man to actually engage in the act of restitution, you must want first do a critical evaluation of your life and relationship with others and see where things have gone out and missing. And you must be sincere with your evaluation. You know, there's a way where you can evaluate a thing and say, oh no, it doesn't really matter, I was not at fault. And, you know, and then you can sweep it under the carpet. You need to be sincere. In Samuel's case, even though it was clear to him, Yet he still called for the third party opinion. If you think that something has gone wrong in the, in the past, come on, I am willing and ready to do what? To restitute. And then the third one, Sister Joy, is um, humility. Humility. the humility. It takes a humble mind to restitute as a believer. Praise the Lord. Amen. It takes a humble mind because some of the restitution can be very challenging. You know, during the preview yesterday, it was mentioned some of those restitution will bring you to a point of humility. For example, if you have taken something in the past and then you have now grown up to become, you know, a public figure, someone who's become very successful, to come out and own up on the wrong that you have done in the past with the aim of making it right, it requires humility. If you are not humble in your mind, you will tell yourself, you will give yourself every reason why that shouldn't be done. You will give yourself every reason. And you remember that the eyes of the Lord has places to you. He can see everything. Whether you sweep it under the carpet or under the rug, whatever you sweep it on, God will still see it. And as far as God is concerned, if it's not dealt with, 
it is still real and still protect danger for that individual. So it requires a lot of dignity. Thank you very much. Now let's quickly move to the next one. There's no need for us to spend more time. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. Anyone who wants to? Thank you, sir. Luke 19, 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Praise okay, Lord. so that's scripture. That was a tax collector now. You know, trying to make it right with God. He was just at a point, he was at a critical point in his life. Destiny has brought him to a crossroads where his life could be made of man. And, and that's why I said to us that it's very important this topic. Because that man got it right. And if you see the next scripture, you'll see what happened there. He got it right because he made the right decision. Okay? What, what do we want to say? What lesson from that was his experience? Luke 19, 8. A quick... Uh, yes, Sister George. Yeah, by saying he will respond four times over, he's owning up the, um, the fact that the value of the thing he took was that increased over time. Yeah. And he's willing to go and make it right up to the value. A good lesson. Thank you very much. So the man is going on. I mean, I'm thinking this in the past. You know, I, I used my into accounting sense to judge yesterday when we were doing the preview. You know something they call the best of judgment? Deogenitization. If an individual has not paid tax for a period of time and the authority catches up with that person, in those days, these people like Zach was collect commission on whatever amount they are able to raise for the government. Now, if an individual has gone, you know, has evaded uh, tax over the period and the tax collector catches up with him and says, yes, I'm giving you best of judgment based on the things I see that you possess. This is what your earning is. And by so, this is what your tax is going to be. Because the man has commission to take on that tax, you know, he could, he could inadvertently inflate the value of earnings for that person so that the person pay higher tax and he gets bigger commission. And so the man is saying, if I have done, if by adventure that has happened, I am willing to pay back even four folds of that thing. Praise the Lord. So that's very key. The willingness. And if you see verse 9, as we move away from this, as you, if you see verse 9, when Zacchaeus made that statement, Jesus Christ said to him, he looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, today salvation is coming to your house. That was the right response. And it was the precursor for salvation for Zacchaeus. And I'm almost very confident that if he had not gone with that kind of attitude, humility, to be able to say, oh, if I've done wrong, I'm willing to pay. Sincerity in his evaluation. If he had not come to that point, I think he would not have been in the right frame of mind to receive salvation on that day. But after that statement, Jesus Christ said, look, Zacchaeus, today, today, not tomorrow, salvation is coming to your house. So the mind, the man was right for redemption. And you and I, when we come to the cross, see, the Holy Spirit here, because the Bible says that it will bring to remembrance things. So there could be some things that have happened in the past that we are not aware of, or that we've lost thought of. The Spirit of God will bring it to remembrance that when that happens, we need to make the right choice and to follow. Remember our memory scripture. To follow suit and make sure it comes. Praise the Lord. Now, Genesis chapter 31, verse 1 to 11 is the Bible passage. Psalm 26. Um, if you can flip to Psalm 26, verse 2. And somebody else, Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24. Those two scriptures speak about the same thing. We're just so we're going to look at them together. Psalm 26, verse 2. Do you have any words there? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Since examine me, O Lord. And try my reins and my heart. That's Psalm 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord. Try my reins and my heart. Okay. Um, somebody 139, Psalm, then 23 and 24. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The way everlasting. Thank you very much. So these two scriptures, what lesson can we learn, especially in relation to personal loss, the city for personal loss? What lesson? 
so that we can rub our minds together. What does it mean in relation to personal losses? So you remember when we said personal losses? Those losses that cannot be quantified in monetary terms, they are non personal. If you look at that scripture, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me, and know my anxiety, and see if there is any wicked way in me. If you find anyone, lead me in the way everlasting. Contribution, please. Sunday school. Is that your Hold on. Uh, brother um, Jude, hold on. I want to. Yeah, brother Fem. Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think the scripture is trying to let us know that we should be able to put ourselves in this state of mind to be in that state to uh, be able to say, okay, search me, O Lord. Because our character, our, uh, our daily dealings, to be the one that can make us to be able to say this, even while we are communing with God, uh, while we are uh, communicating with God, it shouldn't be the one that will be hiding behind and say, uh, am I that clean before Christ? Am I that clean before God to ask of, of a thing? So, uh, invariably, this is saying that uh, in anything we are doing in life, we should always remember that, that there is somebody seeing us and there is someone that we are going to uh, later on, speak to, commune with, with, and I, I, I just believe that uh, we shouldn't go to Christ in a double-minded uh, act. Okay. We should always be conscious of what we are going to portray ourselves uh, about with Christ. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I have two hands. I will come back to you, sir. What comes to my mind is coming to total repentance. Coming to total repentance. Okay. Yes, sir. I think that was David trying to tell God that he's human. He mm. wants God to help his humanity. Because there's no way you can come to true repentance and true restitution without asking God to take away your humanity and let him take over the totality of you. You can be very open before him. He's asking God to help him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those contributions. Can we put our hands together for them? <laughs> now, very well put by all the contribution. Now, the point that I have here is establishing a personal loss is a very tricky thing. And it's a very difficult thing for human beings in your own human capacity to establish. And even when it has been established, it's also always a very difficult thing. You remember we said it's difficult to value it, even in the area of you know paying back. Now, even when we find out that we've done hurt to someone that has resulted into personal loss, it may be difficult for us to try and to, to, to compensate back. Praise the Lord. And also, David found himself in this kind of situation. After all, we all know David's story. David did a lot of things that involve personal loss to other people. A classical example, taking the wife of Uriah. It was a major loss to Uriah that even cost him his life. How would David repay? repay? So David is praying here, he said, God, search my heart. Because if I want to do it by myself, I may not find anything. Help me to search my heart and know my own anxiety on the things that I've done that I've not done. It will require the help of God in this area. To be able to come to that point where we admit that we hurt somebody and that person has you know lost something that is personal to them. And then in the last part, David says, Lord, even when I found these things, help me so that I may lead me in the way eternal. Help me to know the appropriate way to make restitution in this regard. You know, because if it's material things, you can quantify it in monetary terms and you know you just pay it up. But if it involves loss of personal. You know, things that are personal to people, it becomes a little bit tricky and dodgy to be able to evaluate and pay back. It is only through the help of God that you can do this. Now, I will tell you, there was an example that was given to us in the preview yesterday, and I think it just summed it up. Someone who was growing up in a house, took, it was not a biological member of the house, but, you know, an extended family member, but it was, he had the privilege of living with this family. And then he took something valuable to the man of the house and sold it and ate up the money. And when he was found out, instead of you know 
trying to hold up and you know, make it a sin. He started throwing, making up troubles, throwing tantrums. And then he left. Years after, this individual who stole property and sold, property which was inestimable to the owner, came back and you know, he had an encounter with God and he realized that he had done something in the past. Because his action even caused a major breakage in the family in, in those days. People went away on different parts because you know, it was a major force that, that resulted in that relationship was broken. Then he came back when he realized that you know, he had to come to, to terms with this. He came back and he came to the man who was wronged and said, look, I did this X, Y, Z in the past. Even though you knew that I was the one that did it, but I denied it. And because of my denial, people thought you were trying to take advantage of me and there was a breakdown in the relationship. I've come to make right what I have done. You know, if it was a material thing, just re restricting it to the book, people have just looked for the value of the money, perhaps do like Zacchaeus, multiply it by four times and pay back, and that you saw it. But the one who was wrong said, yes, you have done the right thing. The only admissible compensation in this on this graph is for you to go and tell the people the right thing. You know, that's not monetary. That can't be quantifiable. Eh? But the right thing to do to restitute the situation is to go to the people that you said no to before and tell them, yes, I did. And that was deemed as satisfactory. And that took us into the next lesson of time. What is satisfactory um, restitution? We'll spend a lot of time in looking at the kind of restitution. So we just run through what is satisfactory restitution. So that's satisfactory compensation, rather. Satisfactory compensation is something that is given as a restitution to the person who suffered loss instead of the actual thing. In the example that I just gave, that young man cannot go and retrieve the books from the market to come and give it back to the owner. No, he can't. But well, then there is something that can be given to compensate for that. It is essential, it is the estimated value for the compensation as agreed by both parties. So the one who was wronged and the, the one who did the wrong act must agree as to the value of that compensation. In the example I just gave, go and say the truth is the, you know, the right compensation, the estimated value of the right compensation. And he said, a satisfactory compensation may not necessarily replace actual value of the things that were stolen, but must be accepted by the person who is wrong as an adequate compensation. It must be accepted. So it's not just something that you do, you know, unilaterally, to say, well, this is the value of what I took, and then you just, it must be acceptable to the person who was wrong. Praise the Lord. So that's satisfactory compensation. It may not necessarily be the equal value of what was taken, it may not replace what was taken, but it has to be accepted by the person who was wrong. Praise the Lord. Now, the last one. Some guide, yeah, some advice, some ad idea for borrowers and lenders. Now, I, I think I know why this was included in the lesson. You know, most of the time, the reason for restitution is it emanates from, you know, when you take something, you borrow something, and then it becomes difficult to repay it back, it becomes a debt, and you keep carrying it on and on for a very long time. Rather than allowing that situation to, to happen, there are some advice here. There are some advice here. And it says, the first one says, do not give out something on loan if you know you may not get exact back in the event of loss. So you are the one who is giving something like that. Never give out what you term priceless. What you term that you cannot get back if it is lost. Don't give it out. No matter what it is. Because it's going to create a major gap eventually. There is always the danger of the person, of the borrower, not returning what is given out. So in case it is given out and it cannot, you cannot you know, do with the loss of it, don't give it out in the first instance. For example, someone comes to you and says, uh, can you please lend, I'm, 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 in, I'm in financial strain, can you please lend me 1,000 pounds? And you know that 1,000 pounds is too much for you to bear the loss if it's not returned to you. It is advisable not to give it out in the first instance. What you can do is to look at what you are capable of doing and give that out to that individual. Knowing for you whether it may not come back to you. It may not come back to you. 
Because when you give more than what you can cope with the loss out, and if it doesn't come back, it leads into grudge and hatred, and you know, and all the other things that comes with it. Praise the Lord. So that's the first advice. Second advice is to be careful to give out, be careful to give out as the um, things you consider priceless. Okay, that's taking care of that. Be careful not to borrow what you know you cannot replace. Don't borrow what you cannot replace because it becomes a a, 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 um, a debt on you. So those two advices. The last one, significance of restitution. It gives us clear conscience before God and man. It gives us clear conscience before God and man. When we restitute, we can approach God. I think somebody was making that submission. Raphael was making that submission the other time. It gives us clear mind to go to God. We know that we are not owing man, we are not owing God. Praise the Lord. We have made every attempt. We will not be able to do everything, but we made good attempts to make right every wrong that we have done. There's a clear mind. The strategy of the devil is always to bring up guilt in your mind. Oh, you've done terrible thing in the past. You cannot approach God. And then he will quote the scripture to you. God's eyes is too holy to behold sin. There is sin in you. You can't go to God. But meanwhile, you need to approach God at that particular point in time. So he puts ice water on the fire, on the ember that is burning in you. You know, you are like, oh no, I need to go to God. God will answer me when I cry to him in this situation. And then they will just come with quiet and say, you remember what you did on that day? God can see. And because he's still in you, you cannot approach God. You will not answer it. That's the strategy of the devil. But when we are restricted, when we have sincerely searched our hearts, and we brought up a situation that we need restitution and it's been done, we have clear conscience before man and before God. So when we are approaching, we are approaching with boldness, we are approaching with confidence as his son, as his daughter that we can praise the Lord. Amen. And the last one, is this of peace of mind? It gives us peace of mind and it endangers forgiveness from man and from God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, that's our time spent. In summary and in conclusion, summary. Mr. Please, please, please. Oh my goodness. Just one, please. <laughs> just one. But what did my mind say? Just one. Ooh. Okay. Pastor, let, let me take permission because I am right out of time. Okay. Pastor. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. So quick one. What's the place of this restitution when the Bible clearly states that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature? Okay. <laughs> so, the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold. All things are becoming. So he's asking, what is the place of restitution in that context? Ah, okay, Sister John. It's, it's um, just to shut down that voice, that occasional voice that comes when you need to pray, like you just mentioned. Yeah. Restitution is important that you know you have done everything. You stand, yes, a new creation, but in the eyes of God, you're new. In the eyes of the people you want, you need to come out as new. Make restitution, go back to them. Thank you very much, Sister John. Elder John. I think restitution is twofold, or rather three. One to yourself that you have really, really cleared your mind to God, and then to the person whom you committed that offense against. So if you are now born again, how does the person whom, quote and unquote, you have committed that offense against see you? If you are in church, for instance, you, uh, uh, an individual committed murder and then you are in church with the same person who you murdered the son or daughter, how will the person see you? So there's always a need for you to come down to that person to say, I am sorry for this sin, for this thing I have committed against you. Yes, it's you and God. That one, you, all, all things that become is between you and God. But, but what about you and the person? So it's, it's, I think it's a three, three things that form a good. Okay. Any other answer to that? Rajut. Praise God. Uh, I think uh, being born again does not stop. It, it does not uh, remove the, the uh, event of offending a brother. And just like the Bible says, when you come before God, uh, if you realize that you've offended a brother, Leave your office, go back and make peace with whoever you have offended. So that's my. Thank you very much. I don't think there's anything else to say. All things are passed away. Does not does not excuse it from returning what you took, which was not yours. 
and that's where the situation is. And like I said, devil is very skinny. It comes back and keeps raising those things in your mind. And once you do not have a clear conscience between man and God, it becomes an hindrance in your way to freely relate with God. So if we are able to do that, and remember we said it can be very difficult and it requires humility. If you cannot come to that point where you find out that this was done wrong and you need to make right this thing that was done wrong, it means that there's still the absence of humility and it become a barrier in your relationship with God. So being in Christ and all things that become you does not mean that when you know that you've done something in the past, that you need to make it right. It does not excuse you from doing that. Praise the Lord. So that I just summarized all the answers that we've got. Praise the Lord. Now, in conclusion, as we begin to now get up to pray, the situation is desirable. It clears the guilt conscience, which is what we're talking about. It clears the guilt conscience before God and mankind. It clears that guilt conscience. Understand debt of offense cost and make efforts to compensate satisfactorily. That is required for this. Understand the debt of the offense that was caused and make efforts to compensate satisfactorily. If it becomes impossible to compensate, then you know, we talked about God seeing the art, the intention, the art, the things that we want to do, and dealing relating with us from that point, then God knows that. I don't know the answer for that, but I believe that God knows how to face that kind of situation. Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up? So we've seen today how important it is for us not to sweep you know, injustice under the carpet, to make every effort to make right what was done from that we are responsible for as much as we can do. I just wanted to close my eyes and say, Father, please grant me the enabling strength to do justly, to love mercy, and to be humble before God. Grant me that enabling strength. There is a strength that is required to come to that position. Lord, grant me that strength in the mighty name of Jesus to be able to do it justly and to Let's love mercy and to be humble before God at all times. In the name of Jesus. In the case of Zacchaeus, we, see, we saw how Zacchaeus eat the, 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 the bull high by saying that he's ready and willing to compensate back. And the reaction that he got from Jesus Christ was today salvation will come into your life. There are areas of our life that we're expecting God for deliverance, for uplifting. Lord, help me to be able to scan my life, to be able to scan my relationship with people, to be able to scan my past and see is there anything that I've done wrong in the past that I need to make right. And Lord, give me the strength and the willingness to make them right in the mighty name of Jesus. I need your help, Lord. Go ahead and pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Give me that strength, to go, Lord. Give me that inner strength to be able to make right every wrong that I have done in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, give me the strength, oh Lord. Give me the strength, oh Lord. Give me the strength, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. I don't want to be just here out of your word. I want to be able to do your word in the name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want us to pray prayer as we go into the, the other part of the service. Say, Lord God, I need your grace to enter into the land, into my place of blessing that you have provided for me. You know, this is very important at this juncture because we have learned something that is very critical that can accelerate our uh, progress. Lord, the grace to be able to enter into that land. Everyone has a promised land. The land that is flowing with wind and honey. It may not be a physical land. It may be a sphere. It may be an environment. It may be a career breakthrough. Lord, bring me into that land that you have promised me. That land that is flowing with wind and honey. And Lord, if there's anything in my life that can become an hindrance for me progressing into that land, Lord, this morning, Help me to sort them out in the name of Jesus so that I can go without any hindrance, oh God, Lord, into my promised land. So that I can go without any hindrance, without any obstacle into that land that you have blessed me with in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, even this week, every step that I take will be a step, oh God, Lord, forward into that land in the name of Jesus. Every decision that I make this week, oh God, Lord, we advance my course to enter into that land in the name of Jesus. Every engagement that I will engage with this week, oh God, Lord, will be in the right direction, oh God, Lord, to go into that land in the mighty name of Jesus. So shall it be. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Father, Lord, we thank you. Even as we have spoken in your name, oh God, Lord, you will answer us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We ask for strength, oh God, Lord, to do the right thing. 
to do that thing that you expect us to do. Amen. To love mercy, Amen. to do justice, Amen. and to be humble before you. Amen. Lord, we receive that strength this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, faithful Father. Amen. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Apologies, can we just have our seats while we try to get this ready?
Shall we just begin to appreciate the living God? Let's say thank you this hour. Let's appreciate him for all he has done for us. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We glorify your holy name. Indeed, we need him. Indeed, we need him. Every facet of our life, we need him. We worship you, Lord. I need the area
I'm standing 
that in my secret heart, that in my secret heart, I think the keyboard is not a song now, <laughs> that in my secret heart, no other love competes. No other love competes. That in my secret heart, no other love competes. No rival throne survives. No rival throne survives. That I'll serve only you. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a, that's that's okay. Let, can we make that confes uh, confession or that declaration? Okay, let me give you the two. To keep your lovely face Around us, but here it says, Do not love 
the world, all the things in the world. We are the one that's telling us clearly, do not love the world. If you want a position where you, everything that's going on in the world, you love it, you won't have it. Sorry. Do not love the world. It's a clear cut statement from the Bible. Do not love the world. Does it mean we should blow up the world? No. <laughs> but it's telling us, let your affinity, let your interest, let the thing that dominates your heart not be about the world. It's clear cut. And so when we are doing, we are loving the world and the things that are in it, we are playing with fire. We are already, that's a clear cut contradiction or disobedience to the injunctions of God. If anyone loves the world, clearly he says, we have no argument, there's no debate about it, there's no need beating about the bush. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Meaning the love of the Father and the love of the world cannot coexist. You gotta take, take, take one. It's clear cut. Either you love the Father or you love the world. So the option is yours and mine to make, who to love, or where to put our love onto. Let's pass quickly, quickly, and it tells us what this thing we are talking about, the flesh, what it is, you know, what love it is. For all that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Hallelujah. Lust of the flesh. If we have time, who look at what does it mean to have the loss of the flesh? The prongings of the flesh, the things, the desires of the flesh, the things that always want to seek pleasure outside of God. We live in a generation where everybody wants to have flesh. Okay. Having a relaxed life is good, is great. But at what expense? That's the question. At what expense? At what expense? The loss of the flesh, number one. So that's why we say dealing with the flesh, dealing with the flesh today. And I'll give us a few ways we can deal with the flesh, examples or suggestions. The loss of the eyes. Loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes. You know, I could have asked us if this is a prefer teaching, a Bible study session, I would ask what's the difference between the loss of the flesh and the loss of the eyes? The loss of the flesh are those things that we want to do to ourselves that we deem internally, we deem ourselves to make ourselves comfortable, to make ourselves feel okay, to make ourselves feel good, to gratify the feelings that are, uh, you know, burning, to keep, just keep the flesh. When we're talking about the flesh, it's not just the physical uh, body or mass of, uh, you know, tissues we have on our body or muscles or all that. It's also the desires that go with it. That's what he talked about. He's talking about the flesh. Now, the one that is the loss of the eyes are about what we see and how they appeal to us. And that's where it is the loss of the eyes that causes us to be jealous. It's the loss of the eyes that causes us to envy. It's the loss of the eye that causes us to begin to gnaw some thoughts in our hearts that are unhealthy. Or friendly is the loss of the eye. And then, of course, the hand, the pick, pick, pick one. That one will take us away to digest, digest that one. The pride of life. The pride of life. And let me tell you that right inside the church, or right in the body of Christ, these things have a way of finding themselves in there. Nobody is insulated from them. That's the point I'm making. You cannot say you have ascended to any ecclesiastical order or any level in church where these things cannot still find a way of trying to come to you. So we still need to deal with it. Dealing with the flesh. Hallelujah. All of them. The three things that the scripture has clearly stated here, the lust of the flesh, you know, sometimes this flesh God is asking me to rise up and pray for somebody. Let me put you, you are all sorted. Let me deal with myself here. Let me use myself as an example. God is asking me to rise up and pray for somebody. The flesh wants more The flesh wants more realization. The flesh wants this. The flesh wants to eat a little bit more. You want a little 
be more of that. <laughs> I'm seeing some movements in the house now, so I'm not alone. Hallelujah. Amen. The flesh wants more. Just have another one. Another one. And the lust of the eyes, we see. What? Well, that flashy thing, that, you know, all the things we see. It's not good. I mean, I'm not against having beautiful things and all that. But what? How is it pulling you? How is it pulling me? Does it have a towing effect? Towing, like uh, this uh, lift big crane, pulling you or pulling me? The loss of the, the the loss of the eye. And then of course the pride of life is about where we have attained. We will have time to go into this. But because of time. I want us to make some progress. Hallelujah. That's why you remember that song we sang, to keep your lovely face ever before my eyes. If we keep your lo his lovely face ever before your eyes, you circumvent the loss of the eye. And then he said, that no rival throne survived in my secret heart. In my secret heart, no rival throne is there. What is that true? You know, I had a question here as I was preparing. I had a question here. That will help us. I think, keep me on track. Hallelujah. Write that question down because you're going to answer it. Don't give us the answer here. What do you think mostly? Or most of the time? What, what do you think? What are the thoughts that come to your mind? If you can evaluate and analyze the thoughts that you think mostly, the thoughts that dominate your heart, then you will know whether you are in the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eye, and the pride of life. Because you have to deal with these things. That is where you're coming from. What are the thoughts that dominate your mind? Or what do you think most of the time? What are those things you think most of the time? That is also showing where your love is. Do not love the world. For whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's where your love is. What is it that you think most of the time? Now, number two question there is, what do you spend your time on? What do you spend your time on? What do you spend your money on? What do you spend your resources on? What are the things that draw most from you? That could give you a pointer. If it's the things that gratify the flesh, then you can answer that question. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Give us Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. I'm going to read a few scriptures today. And then we'll, after that, we'll read Romans chapter 8. Because since he talks about the flesh and the spirit, they are always, there's that contention between two of them. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. That's a repetition of that summary, or one line summary of sec, uh, uh, second, First John 2.15 we read. Set your mind. Where is it that your mind is set on? And it's not difficult to find out where your mind and my mind is set. And that's what God checks. Today is a solemn one. Hallelujah, church. <laughs> so we need to soak it in. Set your mind on things above. On the things above. You know, when we are looking at, when God is not looking at who he, he, who is shouting the biggest hallelujah in church, it's good to shout hallelujah. And I will encourage you to shout hallelujah. I feel encouraged when you shout hallelujah if I ask you to. Even the choir, everybody that comes from the front, feel good when you are. But that's not where God looks at. God is looking at where is he setting his mind? Where is your mind? Where is my mind set on? And you can see and read where our mind is directed at. Including now that we are talking in church and great number of people here, their mind is on what we are talking about, but there are somebody here whose mind is something else, for example, maybe the deal he will make up for service. <laughs> Set your mind on things above. I did a course many years ago when I started my career. I did a course the that course was to prevent accidents in a workshop. As a young engineer at the time, they were teaching us how to avoid accidents in the workshop. I was working in a workshop of a you know, factory, big factory. A lot of production machines were going on and they were 
particular. And you know what they said on that course? They said three things that cause accident most. They say I is not on task. Mind is not on task. I can't, I've forgotten the third one. But let's deal with these two things. I is not on task and mind not on task. So where is your mind? They, are, they were asking us, when you're doing that job, where is your mind? What are you thinking about? And they relate that to the fact that they know that some people can come to work and re damage, wound themselves or cause problems, or like as the school teacher was talking about, damage the computer, damage the equipment, because their mind was not on the task. Their mind was somewhere else. Generally, some may have had problems from women, but that's, we we'll let me that. The question is, where is your mind? This one is saying, where is your mind? As we journey through this life, as we journey and prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where is your mind? What are the things that dominate your mind? What are the things that dominate my mind? Set your mind. And I like the choice of words here, because this shows us, I don't have a knob here, oh, there's one, this sets us, when it says set, you know you set the temperature. Hello? Hi. There used to be a thermostat there. You set the temperature to 23 degrees or 20 degrees. You set it. You can turn it and tune it to the desired temperature. That's what he said. You are the one responsible. I am the one responsible to set our mind. Where do you want to set your mind to? Set your mind. That gives us control of that. See? You, it all gives us the responsibility. You and I to set our mind where we want it to be. A lot of things are going on in our world, we live it today. But where would you set your mind? You have the knob, the control. Where do you set it? Give us Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And I'm going to talk about desire now. Hallelujah. The word desire. As the dead pants after the waters, so my soul pants after the Lord. You know, that's the word of, I will come to that. And choose, and those who are crucified, uh, sorry, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, flesh with its passion. The flesh has passions, and those passions are born in passions. Hello. Hi. We're they saw the scripture that described the passions that could be in teenagers or young people. The passion to prove a point. The desire just to make a statement and do something and then it drives them into action. It is your passion that drives you into action. And my passion that will drive you into action. Check your actions. The, the next steps you're taking, they are driven by your passion. So where is your passion? What is, where are your desires? What are, where, where are they leading you and I to? Desires. Give us that scripture that I wanted to quote. It is in Psalms chapter 42, verse 1. Psalms chapter 42, verse 1. As the day pants after the water. You know, I did a little study. I think I mentioned it some day ago. You know what the deer? The deer. It's an animal. They say if you put a deer, even in a desert or any place, that deer, because of the desire for water, when it is tasty, because of the strong passion it has to drink water, that it can smell water six kilometers away and start heading that direction. Wow, that's a strong desire. Hmm. Six kilometers. No, six kilometers. <laughs> Excuse me. Huh? I can't even smell water in front of you. It can smell the water from six kilometers away. I start migrating towards that end to locate the water. What's your desire? Just like that, a pool that pulls in to where water is that he can pick it up. He can pick the signal six kilometers away. Uh, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. Panting. That's in my heart. It's not resting until I find the Lord. Hallelujah. Desire. Desire can be good or bad. This is a good desire. This is a good desire. This one is desiring to come closer to God. Desiring to draw closer. Desiring to be with God. That's why he said, as the deer pants after the water, 
Is your heart panting for God? Don't answer. Maybe after today you can answer. What are the desires you have? Twice now, coincidentally, as an object lesson, I've been traveling, for those of you who know, quite a lot this recently. And three weeks ago, I was on a flight with a gentleman, coincidence, just sitting in front of me. And two days ago, I was also in a flight with the same man. But this time around, he was sitting a little bit further away. Now, guess where the, this, I'm bringing up this story. This man, almost 70% of the whole journey of the flight, because he was sitting in front of me some weeks ago, this man spent almost 70% of almost the whole entire journey of the flight, one hour flight anyway, combing his hair. Wow. A man. He combed with his bare hands. I don't have a hair, you can see. <laughs> he combed with a normal comb. He combed with another special one. He packs the hair. He tied it, he, he loses it. And then, two days ago, when I saw him, ah, we were cleaning up to board. I saw the man, I said, ah, 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 man. Oh, that's the man that was sitting in front of me. In fact, after some time, the first one, he, he, because I'm like, who is this person? Because he's just sitting in front of me. After doing all that, then he came out, stood in the, the, the walkway, and was still coming and back. Hallelujah. The desire. That's a passion, isn't it? That's a passion. I wanted to just give you an example to demonstrate passion. Passion to get it. You know, for that one. As the dear pass after the water, so my soul pass after you. Let's move on. The desire, 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 desire. Now, let's go to. First Peter chapter 2, verse 3. For believers, let's leave that one alone. I have told you the story. For the believers, your desire ought to be somewhere. Why I'm bringing up this point is that your desires or the passions you have will decide whether you are favoring the flesh or you are favoring the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Amen. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, Verse 2, verse 2, start from verse 2. Don't be full. Verse 2. Verse 3 is saying if you indeed you have tested it, you know. But let's do verse 2. As newborn babes, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the world. The pure milk, there is pure milk in the word of God. What purchases that pure milk for you is your desire. My desire. Hallelujah. For many people, following God is liturgic. Following God is insipid. Following God is tasteless. Following God does not have a drive. They need, we need to bring all the batteries in this world to jumpstart them. Because the desire is lacking. In the currency of heaven, desire purchases a lot of things. Hallelujah. That's why it says, the eyes of the Lord. And so the school teacher was quoting that's the second chronicle chapter 16 verse 9. The eyes of the Lord runs to and fro, looking for those whose hearts are desiring him. Hallelujah. Amen. Looking for those whose hearts are desiring. Desire the pure milk of the world that you may grow back thereby. You cannot grow much more than you desire. We have been told and taught that yes, you read the word of God, you study the word of God. But can I add something on top of that? For as your pastor today, that it is not just about you reading and reading just to teach the boss exercise, it's about the desire you have. What is driving you? What's the drive you have to get the pure milk of the world? Hallelujah. Amen. For today, by the grace of God, we will have the right desire. Amen. And that's what is going to deal with the flesh. So, to deal with the flesh, I'm still just on the preliminaries today, to deal with the flesh. We must desire the right things. We must desire the sincere milk of the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. Give us Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. We need to be 
the last five minutes so that we can close. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. We were once conducting ourselves in the loss of the flesh. That is to say, what that means, what that scripture says, whatever your flesh says, you do, you do. You do, you were there, I was there. Your flesh tells you drink, you know, you drink, drink a little bit more, you drink, oh, you feel good. On Fridays, the conversations in the offices and workplaces are always how are you going to mess yourself off this weekend? Is that not true? People even pry in, oh, I drank myself to stupor. I did it. I you don't know how to carry it. That's, that's, because, yes, the, the promise of the flesh. That's how the, now, he said, we once conducted yourself in that manner. You were once there. In the lust of our flesh, whatever the flesh wanted, you gave it to the flesh. You did it. All the same. Not minding. The consequences. Just some of them we have to institute. <laughs> so we have told them. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of, of the mind, whatever your mind desired, whether you, you didn't bother to check how well it was right or wrong, you did it for yourself. He said you cond once conducted yourself that way. And we are by nature children of rot. That's what we were before. Just as others. We thank the fellows to move ahead. Give us the next verse now. Verse 4. Now, he said, You once conducted yourself in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desire. But God, who in rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, came and rescued you and I. Now, our desire must change. Hallelujah. Amen. Our desire must change. We cannot have the same desire as we had when we were being moved around by the loss of the flesh. Give us Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. So that I can close with that. Right. And one more. For all the law is fulfilled in one world, even in this, you shall love. Verse 24, not verse 14, verse 24. Verse 24, Galatians 5, 24. And those who are Christ, if you belong to Christ, this is it. If you say, Pastor, what is the gospel truth you have to tell us? Those who are Christ have crucified flesh. And how do you know you've crucified flesh? How? How? What's the telltale sign? With its passions and desire, meaning it is no longer the flesh that controls you with its passions and desires. Something else. Fresh set of desires. Fresh set of passions. is driving you and I. That's what it means that we've crucified the flesh. Dealing with the flesh. Hallelujah. Give us finally. This one is the first Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. You know, when he talked about that love of money and all the things that go with it, he tells us something. There's something we need to pay attention here. So close on that. Look at what First Peter chapter 6, verse 9 says. First Timothy 6, 9. Say, but those who desire, still still desire, okay? The previous scripture was talking about the love of money and all that. He said, those who desire to be rich, and we know that this desire to be rich, people have taken it to an astronomical level now, including doing all manner of things, killing, drinking, doing a lot of things. It's all a product of desire. Hello? When we want to fix the problem of the world, the problem of uh, Yahoo, S Estra, whatever they call it, plus plus, when you want to deal with it, the way to deal with it is to deal with the desire. Those who desire to be rich, they fall into what? Temptations. They fall into temptations and a snare. There's a trap. There's a trap there. There's a trap. And what leads people into that trap is the desire. That's that's we need to hear. So you need to watch your desire. I need to watch my desire. Lead into 
temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful laws. That's a wrong, very, very little combination. Very little, the cocaine. Hmm? Harmful laws. Which drown them. What it means is that there is nobody that can get on that. It's a slippery slope. There is it's a sure way that it, is, it leads to people, it leads people to drowning. We drown. It's not easy to come back out of it. So don't even start in the first place. Hello. Hi. When that desire wants to be, just don't let that desire to take root. Because it leads into many foolish and harmful laws. We drown men in destruction and perdition. That shall not be your portion. Amen. You will deal with the flesh. Amen. Simple way, summary of all I'm saying is watch your desire. Rise up on your feet. Let us pray. Maybe we should pray with that song again. Break that song again, multimedia, please. Hallelujah. Let's take that song again. As we pray with it. One, two, ready, go. To keep your Lord, by your grace we'll draw closer to you. Amen. 
the flesh will not rule over us again. We will rule over the Spirit. Your Holy Spirit will activate our spirit to rule over the flesh. In us. Amen. Thank you, mighty Father. Father, as many that are signing up a new chapter with you today, a new chapter of solid relationship with you, and opening up a new chapter of work with you, Lord, let them experience your power. Lord, put a strong desire for the sincere milk in your world. As the deer pants after the waters, the soil is even six kilometers, it can pick it. Lord, we will desire you. Amen. We will desire your presence. Amen. Thank you, mighty Father. For in Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Amen. If I careful to come and take the offering. Sunday like this, I'd like you to just 
we the answer to Jesus as we recognize him. Okay, there are no first timers. We will be trusting the Lord that by next Sunday we shall be having first timers here worshiping with us to the glory of the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Children, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's rise up as we go. Serve the mission. Thank you. 